a student of Dr. Malik's, and I've recently been studying uh, Muslim Spain. And you mentioned that the Interfaith uh, Conference was, chose Madrid as its location, and I was curious if that was chosen due to its role as both a Christian, Muslim, and Jewish city during the Middle Ages, if it was chosen to reflect uh, its heritage as that center of the three faiths. I think there, there must have been some, some, some uh, idea or, 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 or emotional influence in, in selecting Madrid, in addition to the fact that uh, King Juan Carlos offered to host. <laughs> so it wasn't just uh, ideas and emotions that were, but practicality as well. Uh, but you're right, and yeah, Spain has a very special uh, place in every Arab and, and Muslim's heart, um, and will remain in that, uh, in that position for, for, for time uh, memorial. Uh, so uh, it, it had some, some effect, but more the practic practical aspects than the emotional one of having the king hosted in, in Madrid. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I would like first to thank you for organizing such a distinguished um, event, and I would like to thank you, thank you Your Honor, for uh, coming. Um, within the, within May I ask who you are? Sir? Oh yes, sir, sure. Uh, my name is Hussein, I'm from Tunisia. I'm a Fulbright Scholar and a graduate student at Nazareth College here in Rochester. Um, within the uh, wave of change that are now sweeping the Middle East, um, how do you think or can you comment on the changes now happening you know, uh, in some of these countries and on the Saudi you know, intervention in uh, the Bahraini issue and uh, can you comment also on the future relations between uh, Saudi Arabia and Tunisia, especially after Saudi Arabia, you know, um, accepted to host for the week later uh, Zain Abidin Ben Ali? Yeah. Well, on the on the, uh, uh, the events in, in the Arab world that have taken place since uh, December uh, last year and until now, I prefer to call them Arab troubles rather than Arab Spring or, or Arab Oil. Mm -hmm. I think. To call them spring, we still have some time to go before we see any any blossoming uh, happening in, of the events that have taken place. Uh, and to call it Arab awakening, I think, indicates or seems to imply that I have been asleep all my life and I'm only now awake, and I resent that. So I prefer to call it Arab troubles, uh, and uh, it's still a work in order. I don't think anybody can give you a definitive. A view of where these events are, are going, particularly in the countries where, where they have. Uh, Tunisia seems to have succeeded in holding elections, but there is still a process of, of negotiation and, and uh, uh, differences to be uh, overcome uh, between Tunisians on, on where they are, uh, they are going. And good luck to them. Uh, on uh, the hosting of Ben Ali, uh, the kingdom has uh, never held uh, any grudges against Tunis, uh, and uh, our foreign minister visited Tunis, I think, uh, last month or uh, just before that, before the United Nations General Assembly meeting in September. Uh, so uh, the relations are good, uh, and uh, the kingdom in the past, and I think probably in the future, will have an extensive aid program. For, for Tunis, as it has done with other countries like Egypt and, and so on. So uh, that's as far as the relationship with, uh, with Tunis. On Bahrain, the issues that happened in Bahrain uh, take me back to 1979, frankly. What I briefly referred to here uh, with the Khomeini revolution and the, uh, the attempt by, uh, by the late Imam Khomeini to export his revolution to the rest of the Muslim world. And Bahrain is one of those places where he uh, very actively sought to, to export uh, the, uh, the revolution and incited uh, conflict and, uh, and disturbance in, in Bahrain. Uh, and if you look back at, from 1979 until today, particularly in, in the media and in the, in the television coverage coming from Iran directed at the Arab world, and they have more than six 
um, radio channels and television channels broadcasting in Arabic uh, to, uh, to the Arab world. You will see that that incitement that started in 1979 never stopped. Um, Bahrain is only 25 kilometers from Saudi Arabia. And there is a causeway that links the island of Bahrain to Saudi Arabia. The people of Bahrain, both Sunni and Shia, uh, share with the eastern coast of, of Saudi Arabia many times. And there are Bahraini families that actually live on the Saudi side of that causeway and work in Bahrain. And vice versa, Saudi families that live in Bahrain and work in, uh, in, in, uh, in the kingdom across the, the causeway. So those links have been historic. And they go back forever and will continue to be uh, such. Uh, and when uh, the GCC countries, who are tied by, by treaty obligations to help each other, uh, were called upon by Bahrain to provide support. The first thing they, they commissioned was a, a meeting of the GCC foreign ministers in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, and I think it was uh, the end of February after the disturbances began in Bahrain, where the, uh, the GCC uh, agreed to provide Bahrain with $10 billion uh, over 10 years in economic aid. Uh, subsequent to that, when the situation in Bahrain got even worse uh, in terms of demonstrations and police action against them. Uh, Bahrain asked for, for support, security support from the GCC and Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Qatar uh, sent troops to, uh, to Bahrain. These troops had a specific uh, mission and they had very clear uh, orders of battle that they followed. They were there to protect the infrastructure in Bahrain, the airport, the seaport, the oil refinery, and the business district downtown. Uh, they did not participate in any quelling of demonstrations. They did not arrest any Bahrainis, and they did not shoot at any Bahrainis. So the, the main purpose of these, of these uh, troops was to protect the, uh, the, the infrastructure uh, in, uh, in Bahrain. And the kingdom's public position on Bahrain has been one where we called for and still call for uh, dialogue between the parties in Bahrain as being the only means to resolve the issue. Now, I know that there are mistakes that were committed by the Bahraini government, and I was one of the first to tell my Bahraini friends that you must put your house in order before you can expect us to be helpful to you. But also, I think there were mistakes committed by the opposition. Uh, and uh, King Hamad appointed uh, an independent uh, commission to investigate the happenings of Bahrain, and a priori committed himself to the uh, results of that uh, commission's uh, investigation. I don't know if any of you know uh, Professor uh, uh, Basuni, uh, who heads the, uh, the, the, the commission in, Independent Commission. He's a, an Egyptian uh, jurist, uh, very well respected, not just in the Arab world, but throughout the world. I mean, he has worked on such commissions in the past. Uh, most recently, he was a member of the commission that went to Libya to investigate uh, if there were any human rights violations or crimes against humanity. So he's a man of distinction. And he's the one who chose the members of the commission, not the Bahraini government. Uh, supposedly, in the next weeks, if not sooner, that commission is going to come out with a report. And uh, I think we'll have to wait and see. If the king and the government uh, adhere to the commission's reports, I think we can give them an A grade. Uh, if they don't, then the first to be to, to criticize them will be people like me and you. And I think the Saudi government will take a position on that. Sure, Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Maya. I'm a student of Professor Ima Homeran at the uh, University of Rochester. My question has to do with an issue that was brought up earlier. Um, during the times of trouble in the Republic of Ireland, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, nor Catholics in general in the world, weren't expected publicly to kind of justify their faith in light of the terrorist actions that were taken by the Irish Republican Army. 
I'd like to get your views on the unfair amount of pressure that seems to exist towards Muslims in general and towards um, Muslim countries in this world to prove constantly that in fact Islam is not a religion that is in any way in support of terrorism, is in any way um, um, a fertile ground for the development of terrorism. Um, it just seems to me that this is a very uh, a clear imbalance that exists historically, and I'd like to get your opinion on that. Well, the Muslim world in general has been uh, very uh, vocal in condemning uh, terrorist acts in general, uh, and in particular on, on terrorist acts undertaken uh, by groups like, uh, like Al-Qaeda. Um, the thing about Al-Qaeda is that it was, if you like, uh, I hope nobody is offended by this, it was very democratic in its, in its horrors. Uh, it, it killed people no matter who they were, uh, Muslims, non-Muslims, and so on. But as was earlier said, then, they used Quranic verses and hadith from the Prophet uh, to peace be upon him to justify uh, their, their action. And I can talk about the kingdom more than, than other countries. And as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the, uh, the religious establishment in the kingdom has been very vocal and forward in condemning uh, these, uh, these acts and that misuse, if you like, or rather abuse of, of religion by uh, such uh, people who use uh, these uh, horrible methods to try to achieve whatever aims uh, they, they aim to, to achieve. But you're right, Danny. I tell my American audiences uh, that I, I, my children, my grandchildren, their grandchildren will live with the memory that 15 of the 19 perpetrators of September 11th were Saudis. This is a weight that we will have to bear for the rest of, of our lives. Uh, I can't remove that weight from, from my shoulder. What I can do is try to prevent such happenings from, from taking place again. And I think the same can be said for, for other Muslims. And the work that Professor Malik and others like him in this country and in, in other countries to bring people together, to exchange views, and to, to at least to show respect to each other goes a long way to removing not only some of the stigma from us Muslims as being blamed for all these acts that were done by these people, but also, I think perhaps even to relieve the conscience of, of the other parties as well in, in, in the fact that if they are holding um, uh, troublesome views of, of Muslims and so on, at least they can find someone they can talk to that can explain to them where we are coming from as, as Muslims. So uh, that's the only way to go, and I think education in universities and in schools and so on is really the route to overcome these uh, these differences. Thank you. Thank you.